uh, now i would like to uh, invite the session chair sangeeta patre who is one of the uh, founding members of curry leaf along with alappan and she has done her ms by research from iser trivandrum and currently she is a visiting faculty in a college in thane called dn bandorkar college thank you jaskaran uh, so uh, we have two uh, speakers for the day uh, you all will get 25 minutes to uh, talk about your topic and plus 5 minutes for uh, the question and answer session uh, so let us move to our uh, first speaker she is uh, her name is mugdha pokhrankar she is currently in first year of integrated phd in iser bhopal and her topic for the day is uh, a topological proof of kelly hamilton theorem so i would like to invite her and move the over to you thank you for kind introduction we are going to discuss a topological proof of kelly hamilton theorem today let us first see what kelly hamilton theorem is about Uh, we will fix some notation for that first. Mm. We will denote the set of all n cross n complex matrices by M N C, the set of all polynomials in X with coefficients in C by C of X. And if we have a matrix A in M N C and a polynomial P of X given by A M X to the power M plus one plus A one X plus A zero in C of X. then we define some matrix called p of a which is again a member of mnc and how do we define it just substitute a in place of x in this polynomial p so it gives a plus so on plus a1 a plus a0 times identity matrix and denotes the identity matrix okay then we, we can ask the question mm -hmm. that given a matrix a in mnc can we find the polynomial p such that p of a is the zero matrix the obvious answer can be take zero polynomial okay but that's the trivial case so we can ask the non trivial question namely given a matrix a in mnc does there exist a non zero polynomial px in cx such that p of a is the zero matrix and the answer to this question is yes how consider this space mnc as a vector space over c what is its dimension n squared so if you take any n square plus 1 elements in mnc they are linearly dependent in where so on to n square they are linearly dependent so by definition of linear dependence what do we get there exist scalars a0 a1 so on up to a n square such that not all of them are zero and a0 in plus a1 a plus so on plus a n square capital a n square is the zero matrix but if you observe the left hand side you can observe that it is p of a for some polynomial p and what is that polynomial p a n square x raised to n square plus so on plus a1 x plus a0 right so we have a non zero polynomial px given by this so that p of a is the zero matrix Okay, so we have a polynomial, non-zero polynomial of degree less than or equal to n square, such that it gives zero matrix when evaluated at a. But the problem is that we don't know what are the scalars a zero, a one up to n square. We know their existence only. We don't know their explicit construction or explicit formula. Okay, but that is fine. We can ask one more question. 
by the way i may use sometimes the uh, term annihilating a say polynomial p annihilates a means p of a is the zero matrix that's what i mean we will ask one more question does there exist a non zero polynomial of smaller degree say n which annihilates a and interestingly the answer to this question is also yes and not only we know the existence of such a polynomial we know how to construct such a polynomial and this is what is given by kelly hamilton theorem and this polynomial which we get with this property is called a characteristic polynomial let us see what is the formal definition of the characteristic polynomial of a matrix given the matrix a in mnc the characteristic polynomial of a denoted by fa of x is the polynomial in x defined by fa of x is equal to determinant of x i n minus a if you observe carefully this polynomial is of degree n and kelly hamilton theorem actually gives what we wanted let us state the kelly hamilton theorem suppose a is a matrix in mnc then the characteristic polynomial fa x of a is satisfied by the matrix a that is fa of a this matrix is the zero matrix okay now we have to prove this kelly hamilton theorem we are going to use some topological techniques for that first let us see what is the outline for that we will first observe that this theorem is true for some easy class of matrices and what is that class the set of all diagonal matrices in mnc okay and then we want to make some general observation we have to find some class of matrices bigger class such that this kelly hamilton theorem is true for those matrices for that we have to we should be able to reduce those matrices reduce in some sense those matrices to diagonal matrices what are such matrices namely the diagonalizable matrices right so we will then observe that this theorem is true for diagonalizable matrices and we will then observe that this set of all diagonalizable matrices is not small it is actually big enough to conclude from just the uh, just the fact that uh, kelly hamilton theorem holds for diagonalizable matrices that it holds for any arbitrary matrix in mnc and that is where topology comes in we will show that the set of all diagonalizable matrices in mnc is dense and finally using again topology we will show that then we can conclude that the kelly hamilton theorem is true in the sense that it is true for any matrix in mnc okay let us start the proof step by step first we have to prove that the theorem is true for all diagonal matrices so let us start with some diagonal arbitrarily fixed diagonal matrix a whose diagonal entries are lambda 1 lambda 2 to lambda n we have to see what is its characteristic polynomial it is determinant of x i n minus a so let us first see what is the matrix x i n minus a it is the diagonal matrix x minus lambda 1 x minus lambda 2 x minus lambda n these are its diagonal entries and what is the characteristic polynomial determinant of this matrix so in since it is a diagonal matrix it is nothing but the product of diagonal entries right then we have to see what is fa of a so we have to substitute a in place of x so we will get product of from k to k is equal to 1 to n of a minus lambda k i n 
So let us first observe what is a minus lambda k i n. This matrix is again a diagonal matrix whose end, first entry is lambda 1 minus lambda k, so on lambda k minus 1 minus lambda k. Kth diagonal entry will be lambda k minus lambda k, which is 0. So on last entry, diagonal entry will be lambda n minus lambda k. So in every such matrix, a minus lambda k i n, kth entry will be 0. Now we have to take product of such matrices. So it will be again a diagonal matrix. And how do we multiply diagonal matrices? We get again a diagonal matrix whose entries are the product of corresponding diagonal entries of the matrices whose product we are taking. So first diagonal entry of this matrix FA of A will look like lambda. So if you observe, its first term will be 0. For second diagonal entry, second term will be 0. And for nth diagonal entry, nth term will be 0. So finally, we get that FA of A is the diagonal matrix where all diagonal entries are 0, which is nothing but the 0 matrix. So we have observed that Kelly-Hamilton theorem is true for diagonal matrices. Means di sorry, characteristic polynomial. I mean. Now next step is to show that the theorem is true for diagonalizable matrices. So let us start with a matrix A in MNC, which is a diagonalizable matrix. Can anyone say what do we mean by this? A is a diagonalizable matrix. If A is similar to a diagonal matrix. Right. So what does it mean by uh, saying similar to there exists an invertible matrix B such that B inverse AB is a diagonal matrix. Right. Let us call that diagonal matrix as B. Okay. Um, before going further, can you give me some examples of diagonalizable matrices? I mean, it will be better if you can give me some class of some class of examples of diagonalizable matrices. Diagonal matrices are diagonalizable, right? But we have already observed what happens with diagonal matrices. What is next easy example? Symmetric matrices. Oh. Triangular matrices. Are all triangular matrices diagonalizable? No, you think about it. Uh, if I take the class of all matrices uh, such that they have n distinct eigenvalues, are they diagonalizable? Yes, right. So keep this example in mind. We will use it somewhere. Okay, let's coming back to what we were doing. So we have a diagonal matrix now. And we have already proved something about diagonal matrices, which we want to use it here. So we want here a characteristic polynomial of A. We will write, try to write it in terms of characteristic polynomial of D because we know something about characteristic polynomial of D. So let us first start with uh, what is the characteristic polynomial of D. It is determinant of Xi and minus D. We replace identity matrix by B inverse B and D by B inverse AB. 
by some prop using the properties of determinant for example it is multiplicative you can come up with determinant of b inverse times determinant of x i n minus a times determinant of b then since they are, they are complex numbers they commute you will get this step and determinant of b inverse is nothing but inverse of determinant of b right determinant of b inverse times determinant of b this becomes one so we are left with determinant of x i n minus a which is the characteristic polynomial of a so what did we get the characteristic polynomial of b it's same as the characteristic polynomial of a and what do we know about characteristic polynomial of a that the diagonal matrix d satisfies its characteristic polynomial so f d of d is zero but we already have f a of x is same as f d of x so f a of d is also zero f a of d is also the zero matrix okay so now but we have to show that f a of a is zero matrix so we want some relation between f a of a and f a of d keeping in mind the relation between a and d namely b inverse a b is d for that we will use this observation i will not prove it here you can try it like later for any polynomial p x in c x we have p of d is equal to b inverse p of a times b the main fact that we use to prove it is this d raised to k is b inverse a b bracket raised to k which comes out to be b inverse a raised to k times b and this is true for any non negative integer k and you can use some of these properties also to prove that p of d is b inverse p of a times b so in particular for characteristic polynomial also this holds so we get f a of d is b inverse f a of a times b so what is f a of a b times f a of d times b inverse but f a of d is the zero matrix so f a of a is zero matrix so we proved that any diagonalizable matrix satisfies its characteristic polynomial okay now the main step which uses topology comes we have to show that the set of that means what we have to show you take any matrix in m and c we have to approximate it using the using diagonalizable matrices so to approximate we need some notion of distance right so we have to first make this mnc a matrix space so we will do that first and how we will do we will define a distance on mnc matrix on mnc using a norm and that norm also arises from inner product on mnc and what is the inner product that we are using on mnc it is as follows if you take uh, two matrices a and b in m and c we define their inner product a, inner product a with b as trace of a b star b star not conjugate transpose of b this may look uh, this definition may look strange but if you matrix a is a b is the matrix b is a then inner product of a with b is nothing but some a is a b is a bar where i is a run from 1 to n if you observe carefully this is nothing but the inner product on c n square c raised to n square this space and we can easily show that this is indeed an inner product on mnc and then this gives rise to a norm 
defined as norm of a to be um, square root of inner product of a with a and then this induces a metric d on m and c how is it defined distance between a and b to be norm of a minus b which we do in many cases okay so we have now m and c as a metric space now how will you uh, prove that the set d of diagonalizable matrices is dense in m and c we will given a matrix a in m and c we will produce a sequence in b which is the set of all diagonalizable matrices which converges to a and how we are going to do that for that we will use one trick let me spell out that trick we will not do this first for any arbitrary matrix in m and c we will do it for upper triangular matrices so given an upper triangular matrix t in m and c we will produce a sequence of diagonalizable matrices which converges to t this is what we want to do but we will do something better we will produce a sequence of upper triangular matrices in m and c with n distinct eigen values which converges to t we already know that uh, such a matrix is diagonalizable such a means with n distinct eigen values so we'll try to do this for that let us fix some upper triangular matrix t first and how we are going to produce such a sequence idea is to keep all other entries except diagonal entries as they are and just change the diagonal entries by small amounts so that they become distinct so that the matrix will remain upper trend the matrices which we are considering for sequence they remain upper triangular but they have distinct eigen values this is what the idea is and to make them distinct let us first see how this matrix t look like i am naming uh, the entries of t as t i z and for the uh, entries which are below diagonal i am defining t i z to be 0 and i am just naming the diagonal entries as lambda 1 lambda 2 up to lambda n for our convenience now i want to change these entries by little amount what is the first candidate that comes to our mind when we have to change something by little amount something like 1 by m right we are using here n so i am uh, using the letter m for elements of sequ indices in sequence but if we change all the entries by same amount say 1 by m then it will not serve our purpose because if uh, suppose lambda 1 and lambda 2 are same then however many times you subtract the same amount from lambda 1 and lambda 2 you will keep getting uh, these two entries at same they will not become distinct mm. at any point of time. hello hello But lambda i's are distinct. Uh, what what? The lambda i's are distinct, no? No. In this matrix, they are not distinct. We are taking any arbitrary oh. upper triangular matrix. Oh, sorry, sorry. The eigen values are distinct. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the entries on diagonal of upper triangular matrix represent its eigen values, right? Ah uh, yes, then we are choosing the eigen values to be distinct. No, not here. Here the uh, T is the matrix with which we are starting, and now we have to find a sequence of upper triangular matrices with distinct eigen values which converges to this matrix. I have not yet defined which sequence we are considering whose eigen values are distinct. Is it okay? okay, okay. okay so my, my point is that we will have to vary all the diagonal entries by different amounts but still small amounts so that they become distinct and 
that sequence converges to t so this is our candidate the mth entry of that sequence namely tm and i am defining to be this i am changing the first diagonal entry to lambda 1 minus 1 by m second entry to lambda 2 minus 2 by m so on nth entry i am changing to lambda n minus n by m <coughs> now let us see if this mat uh, this sequence of matrices serves our purpose these are upper triangular matrices that is fine but are there diagonal entries distinct the answer is no not in general but let us see when can they equal when can they be equal i'm just redefining what we are saying what is the matrix t and how we are defining the matrix tm all other entries are same except diagonal entries and diagonal entries are like this okay let us see a matrix tm has repeated eigen values that means repeated diagonal entries if and only if there exist two integers between 1 and n two distinct integers i and i prime such that lambda i minus i by m is equal to lambda i prime minus i prime by m it means the diagonal entries at i and i prime position are same and if we rewrite this equation we will get m times lambda i minus lambda i prime is equal to i minus i prime now if we fix i and i prime how many values are there which satisfy this equation at the most one right it may happen that this equation does not have a solution for example if lambda i is equal to lambda i prime then we will not get solution to this equation but if lambda i minus lambda i prime is non zero then this equation will have only one solution namely i minus i prime divided by lambda i minus lambda i prime so this equation has at most one solution when we are we have fixed i and i prime hello uh, uh one small correction i think even when lambda i and lambda i prime are distinct you need not have one solution because the m that you are looking for is an integer right 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 so in that case also it may not have solution in case lambda i minus lambda i prime is non zero and i minus i prime divided by lambda i minus lambda i prime is an integer then only uh i mean natural number not only integer if that uh, ratio is natural number then only this equation will have a solution in any case how many matrices are there in which the entries at i and i prime position diagonal entries can repeat the answer is at most one when we have fixed i and i prime keep that in mind and then how many such pairs can be there as many choices of two distinct integers from n integers are there namely n into n minus 1 by 2 many unordered pairs i comma i prime can be there such that the entries at i and i prime position can be equal so finally i conclude that the set of all in uh, natural numbers m for which tm has repeated eigen values is finite in fact it has less than or equal to n into n minus 1 by 2 many elements no. Okay, that but, means that uh, hmm. that means that in the original matrix T, hmm. lambda one may not be equal to lambda two, hmm. but in T M, uh, lambda one minus one by M and lambda two minus two by M may be equal. Right, right. So we we exclude that M. 
right okay so like that we there take all of them there are many uh, yeah. such bad matrices hmm. in that sequence hmm. so we can just remove them and hmm. still we get a sequence which is yeah. a sub sequence of the original sequence okay this we know formally we can construct like this consider the set n minus s which is infinite subset of n and so we can order this and corresponding to that order we consider a sub sequence tmk of tm and by construction all the matrices in the sub sequence tmk are upper triangular and they have n distinct eigen values okay good so only task with which we are left are left is showing that this sequence converges to the original matrix t and it is easy let epsilon greater than 0 be given for any positive integer k you see what is distance between tmk and t it is norm of tmk minus t tmk minus t is this diagonal matrix computing its norm is easy it comes out to be this when upon mk time some constant and then we stage that means a uh, positive integer k such that 1 by k is less than epsilon times inverse of this constant and then if you choose any small k greater than or equal to k then you will get distance between tmk and t to be less than epsilon so the sequence tmk converges to d so given any upper triangular matrix t we have a sequence of diagonal eligible matrices in fact something better which converges to t now what we have to um, show such a sequence exists not only for upper triangular matrices it is there for any arbitrary matrix a in mnc <coughs> so let us start with arbitrary matrix a we have to find a sequence in d which is the set of all diagonalizable matrices which converges to a now here we have to reduce this case to the case of upper triangular matrices so we want some relation between a and we have to find some nice upper triangular matrix which is related to this matrix a and this relation is given by sure decomposition which is true for matrices over complex numbers by sure decomposition we get an upper triangular matrix t and a unitary matrix u unitary matrix means you, uh, if we say u is a unitary matrix if u times u star is identity matrix that means u star is the inverse of u such that a is u star tu now since t is a per triangular matrix we have a sequence tk let us say tk in d which is the set of diagonalizable matrices which converges to t so we now have obvious choice for a sequence which converges to a let us call the terms of that sequence ak defined as u star tk u for every positive integer k so we have now sequence ak and since tk is a diagonalizable matrix ak is also a diagonalizable matrix i am not going to prove it here you can take it as an exercise to show that ak is a sequence in D, the set of all diagonalizable matrices. Our claim is that the sequence converges to A. For that, we consider what is the distance between A K and A. It it gives u star times T K minus T times u. Norm of that. And if you use the definition of norm, you will get it square root of trace of u star times tk minus t times tk minus t star times u and we use one result here that 
trace remains invariant under conjugation so trace of this matrix is same as trace of tk minus t times tk minus t star then take its square root you will get the norm of tk minus t which is nothing but distance between tk and t now the sequence tk is converging to t so sequence ak should also converge to a this is what we get so we now have, now have a sequence in d the set of all diagonal isomorphic matrices which converges to a so this finally proves that the set d of all diagonal isomorphic matrices is dense in mnc now just we have to observe that the kelly hamilton theorem is true for any matrix in mnc using the dense uh, diagonal isomorphic matrices mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, you have crossed uh, like 25 minutes so uh, is it fine if you wind up things uh, like quickly yeah in 2 to 3 minutes i think yeah okay thank you okay we will use one fact here in matrix spaces suppose x and y are matrix spaces and d is a dense subset of x and f and j are continuous functions from x to y such that they are equal on d the dense set then we can conclude that they are the same f and j are the same on the whole space x now let us compare this situation with the situation which we have consider these matrix spaces x and y both to be mnc we have a dense subset d of diagonal isomorphic matrices we have two functions from on mnc which are same on dense subset and what are those functions namely a going to fa of a and a going to the zero matrix because on d fa of a is same as the zero matrix so these two functions agree on dense subset d so if we can show that both of these functions are continuous then we are done by this theorem this fact out of that a going to 0n is constant map and hence it is continuous so we are done if we show that the other map a going to fa of a is continuous and it is slightly tricky i will just give hint we will write this map as the composition of two maps for that i am using one notation namely cn of x which denotes the c vector space of all polynomials in x of degree at most n with complex coefficients you define the two maps as follows the map phi what does it do it takes pair a comma p of x and gives us back p of a matrix in mnc and what does psi do it takes matrix a in mnc and gives back a pair a comma fa of x fa of x is the characteristic polynomial okay it is easy to see that the composition of these two maps is the map which we want a going to fa of a and to show that uh, see we are we have to show that a going to a fa of a that map is continuous we will be done if we show that these two maps phi and psi are continuous and how do we show that for that we will need some some more tools namely we will have to identify mnc with cn square cnx with cn plus 1 via natural homeomorphisms and we will have to use universal property of the product topology and the continuity of the determinant map using these things we can show that the maps phi and psi are continuous and since uh, the map which we want a going to fa of a is composition of these two continuous map we finally get that the two continuous map which uh, agree on the dense subset and hence they agree on the full space so for any matrix a in mnc fa of a is the zero matrix which is nothing but the kelly hamilton theorem okay so we are done with proving kelly hamilton theorem let me just uh, say what are my references first i used kumar eisen's article on a kelly hamilton theorem a topological proof in which 
he has given the outline of the proof and uh, for the last part namely to write the map a going to fa of a as composition of two maps i use this reference second reference okay thank you if you have any questions we can discuss in the question and answer session thank yeah thank you mukta uh, for this talk uh, i would like to uh, ask the audience uh, if there are any questions please ask any questions okay so uh, let us thank the speaker thank you mukda